Hi, thanks for clicking on my YouTube. We're going to explore the confusing passages in 1 Corinthians. Statements like, It's for this reason that a woman ought to have authority over her own head because of the angels. What does that mean? And, Women should remain silent in the churches. Why should there be a rule to silence women in the New Testament when there's none in the Old? And why would Paul silence women but then encourage them to speak just a few verses later? He says, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, be eager to prophesy. To understand what's going on here, we need to understand what was happening in the church at Corinth. We need some background information. Chapter 1 tells us that Paul wrote to the Corinthians while he was in Ephesus. He explains, I will stay on at Ephesus until Pentecost. Ephesus was about 400 k's from Corinth, so not too many visitors would be going back and forth. However, chapter 16 tells us that three friends had come from Corinth to Ephesus to visit Paul. I am glad of the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaicus, for that which was lacking on your part they have supplied. It's fairly obvious that they would have brought with them the letter from the Corinthian church to which Paul is replying, and also the verbal concerns of those of Chloe, which we're going to look at in a minute. There's a whole lot of strife in Corinth, and these three friends have gone from the church in Corinth to Paul in Ephesus to sort it out. Clouding the understanding of 1 Corinthians is a translator bias, especially in the King James Version. Let's look at chapter 1 more carefully. Notice, notice I've crossed out the word household because it's been added by translators and shouldn't be there. Those of Chloe's household should read by those of Chloe. Let's read it. It has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? The controversy here seems to be those of Chloe saying they're not being treated equally. After all, they were taught the gospel or perhaps baptised by a woman. It seems that those of Chloe have taken their problems to Paul in person as the word declared implies. It may even be that Fortunatus and Achaicus were those of Chloe and had travelled to Paul with Stephanus, the little group we saw at the start. Those of Chloe have gone to Paul and complained about their treatment by those of Cephas, etc. So clearly some of the divisions in Corinth were over who was more important, and those of Chloe seem to be right down the bottom of the pecking order. Throughout 1 Corinthians, there are the set of, of three voices being heard, the concerns of those of Chloe, the church writers who sent a letter to Paul, and Paul's response to all their concerns. Chapter 7 is where we see that Paul is responding to the matters some of the church members had written about, now concerning the things of which you wrote to me. As we're going to see, the members who have written to Paul are the ones who are trying to silence women. There's another problem which compounds the confusion going on. The NIV translators have started to correct it. Notice the difference between the New King James and the NIV. There are quotation marks. They recognise that parts of the chapter are the things said by the church at Corinth to which Paul is replying. In other words, they are not Paul's thoughts but those of the church. This is how 1 Corinthians is written. Paul's responses to ideas of others and very often wrong ideas. The trouble is that all too often we've taken the words at face value and attributed them to Paul when really they were the matters Paul was replying to and quoting. 
As most people know, there were no quotation marks in the original Bible texts. Understanding that both sides of the dialogue are included will help us to understand 1 Corinthians. Paul is replying to the matters they wrote about. Let's look at an example. People in the church with the Holy Spirit were speaking in tongues. This included both men and women. There was an argument about the purpose of speaking in tongues. Was it for believers or non-believers? Two completely opposite views which contradict each other. This can only mean that Paul is quoting what the Corinthians were saying and then giving his view. Let's take a look. Verse 21 and 2 of 1 Corinthians 14 tells us that tongues are a sign for unbelievers. In the law it is written, With other tongues and through the lips of foreigners I will speak to this people. So tongues then are a sign not for believers but for unbelievers. And I believe this is the church view put forward here. But verse 23 says the exact opposite. But if the whole church comes together and everyone speaks in tongues and inquirers or unbelievers come in, will they not say you're out of your mind? So Paul is saying that tongues are for believers. Within two verses are two completely opposite views. Clearly one is the view of the church writer and one is the view of Paul. Following straight on in the same chapter is the argument that women should be silent. As in all the churches of the saints, the women should keep silence in the churches. For they are not permitted to speak, but should be subordinate, even as the law says. If there's anything they desire to know, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. This passage was written by those who clung to the traditions which silenced women. They were even trying to silence women who had the gift of the Holy Spirit and were speaking in tongues. They couldn't cope with the idea of change. The thought that God poured his spirit out on both men and women who were equal in Christ clashed with everything they had always known. No wonder they wrote to Paul, hoping he would back up their man-made traditions. But Paul objects to their suggestion in a very decisive manner. What? Did the word of God originate with you? Or are you the only ones it has reached? If anyone thinks they are a prophet or otherwise gifted by the Spirit, let them acknowledge that what I am writing to you is the Lord's command. And if anyone ignores this, they should themselves be ignored. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, zealously prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues. Nothing could be clearer than this. Paul is saying that the view which forbids a woman to speak is absolute nonsense. Not only is it nonsense, but it's the Lord's command that speaking in tongues and prophesying should not be for forbidden. The NIV correctly translates brethren as brothers and sisters here. Unfortunately, this word brethren sometimes stops us realizing that sisters or women are included too. If anyone thinks they are a prophet or otherwise gifted by the Spirit, let them acknowledge that what I am writing to you is the Lord's command. And if anyone ignores this, they themselves should be ignored. Therefore, my brothers and sisters zealously prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues. Paul follows on by asking two questions. The first question was, did the word of God originate with you? The word of God did not originate with these men, it originated with Jesus. As if to answer this question, John 1 says, In the beginning was the word, and in him was life. The word came out from Jesus, not these men. The second question Paul asked was, Are you the only ones it has reached? The light of Jesus reached women and men alike. To all who received him, to all who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. So being born of God supersedes being male or female.
The old customs no longer applied. They never did. But what was the law that the church writer was referring to in verse 34? They are not permitted to speak but should be subordinate even as the law says. There's no law in the Old Testament which silences women nor makes them subordinate to men. However, even the common law did make women subordinate. Under Roman law, men had power and control over women. So this would seem to be the context of this passage. The writers from Corinth thought that origin mattered. Who was first? Woman was from man, thus man more important. But Paul wants them to know that the head of every man is Christ. Every man means man and woman, everyone. The origin of woman, singular, was man, but that's only talking about Eve. The argument continues, nor was man created for the woman, but woman for the man. Paul corrects this narrow thinking. Eve might have been formed from man and for man, but the, the man, singular, talking of Jesus, is of the woman, talking of Mary. Common sense also tells us that every man since Adam is born of woman. Christ himself, the head of every man, came from a woman. Then follows another section by the church members. Every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonours her head, for that is one and the same as if her head were shaved. Paul replies, It is for this reason that a woman ought to have authority over her own head because of the angels. Paul is saying that women should have independent authority over their own heads to make up their own mind about what they put on it or what they leave off. But the reason for this is puzzling. Because of the angels, what does that mean? Let's look at this word angel. It's one of several Greek words in the New Testament which translators decided not to translate. They did the same with Satan, which just means adversary. Angel should have been translated as messenger. And when it's a supernatural angel, it's obvious from the context. The Greek noun angelos simply meant message bearer or messenger. In ancient Greek, the word angelos was used of things such as beacons, which were messages of using light. Uh, it was used of poets who sent messages with words and it was even used of birds. This is a picture of the poetess Sappho and a line from one of her poems written about 600 BC. Notice the word angelos is used in her poem and translated it means something like the dear glad messenger of the spring, the nightingale. So angel simply means messenger. There are good angels and bad angels. We're told, even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. If we translate Satan and angel into English, the passage reads like this. Even the adversary disguises himself as a messenger of light. We're warned not to, take, not to be taken in by those imposing traditions of men, exactly what's been happening in 1 Corinthians. Colossians 2.8 tells us, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy which depends on human tradition. The teachers of these traditions might look nice on the outside. They might even have kind faces, but always compare their teaching to what Jesus said. If they're imposing a tradition of man, don't listen to them. The Jews wanted everyone to follow their traditions. They even followed Paul around so they could make sure people weren't influenced by him. Acts 17 tells us, When the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached of Paul at Berea, they came there also and stirred up the people. 
So these Jews are a good example of what a bad messenger is. When Paul wrote 2 Corinthians, the church in Corinth was still plagued by the people imposing wrong messages. Mm. Paul equates people with wrong messages with the serpent who deceived Eve, and so the picture of the snakehead on this person. He says, But I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray. <clears throat> For if he that comes preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, you are all too willing to listen. This is a warning for everyone, men and women, not to be led astray by wrong teaching as Eve was. Back to 1 Corinthians. There were messengers giving a wrong message. Nor was man created for the woman, but woman for man. Yes, Genesis does say that God made Eve for Adam. But God didn't turn this into a reason for man to elevate himself as her superior, as these men in Corinth were doing. Paul says that because of them and their wrong teaching, women should be given authority to make their own decision about what they wear on their head. So it is for this reason that a woman ought to have authority over her own head because of the messengers. And I think we can add misguided messengers here. It's plain that the traditions they are promoting are being rejected over and over by Paul. Paul continues, Even though the woman has this independence over her head, yet in other ways she's not independent fully of the man, for in fact she's the origin of the man. Paul introduces the new creation where man is born of woman. He reverses the thinking the traditions are based on. He says, Nevertheless, in the Lord woman is not independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For as woman came from man, so also man is born of woman. Paul finishes his letter by reminding them that Stephanus was the first fruits of the church in Achaia. So if order matters, he's right up there. In the, he's the origin, if you like. But more importantly, he's devoted himself to good works. Paul is telling the Corinthians to submit to Stephanus and not only him but those who labour with him, clearly meaning Fortunatus and Achaicus, who are most more than likely those of Chloe. <clears throat> Paul's final message harks back to the one at the start, the elevation of one group over another. Paul tells them to submit to all who devote themselves to the ministry of the saints. Men and women, they're all equal. So why does understanding all this matter? Because women have always proclaimed God's message. There's Huldah in the Old Testament, just one example. She said, this is what the Lord said, the God of Israel. So she was a prophetess speaking God's words. Acts 2, quoting Joel, reminds us that both sons and daughters were to prophesy. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. And of course, finally, in 1 Corinthians 14, the very chapter which on the surface seems to silence women, encourages them to speak. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, be eager to prophesy. Why do they need encouragement to speak? because there are people trying to silence them. It's the church members who have written that women are to be silent, but Paul is saying that everyone should desire to prophesy. My brothers and sisters be eager to prophesy. For more information on this and other Bible subjects, I hope you'll check out my blog or download my free books from these links. And thanks very much for listening.